Hello and welcome to this video introduction to the OPC UA for Machine Tools job model. My name is Tonja Heinemann and I will first present the model to you and then show some examples how to use it. The intention when designing the Machine Tools job model was mostly to get information from the machine tool about its current status related to the job. This data can then later be used to aggregate uh, information from it. For example, the question, how productive is the machine? That would be used um, with aggregated data to calculate KPI values. Or the question, how long does one job take? That is usually also calculated from aggregated data. The third example question on this slide, what is the machine doing? Is a question referring to the current status on the machine tool. The model is not intended to actually load the job onto the machine, machine tool or to control the job. This slide gives an overview of the complete machine tools information model. The model revolves around the machine tool type, which is subdivided into the five parts identification, monitoring, production, equipment, and notification. For the rest of this presentation, we will focus on the production part. The production component of the machine tool type is of production type as shown on this slide. It aggregates the active program, it optionally contains the production plan, and it optionally contains the statistics showing information about the parts produced in the lifetime of the machine tool. On the following two slides, we will have a deeper look into the active program and the production plan. The production active program type is shown on the right hand side of this slide. It optionally contains the job node ID and the job identifier. Both are used to link the program to the job it belongs to. It always has a node called state and state indicates if the program is currently being run or not. We will have a closer look at the state on a later slide. The production active program type also inherits the program name and number in list from the production program type. Number in list is used to enumerate programs in a list. For this reason, it is not terribly important for the production active program type, but the inheritance of the program type is uh, more important to us. That's why we just keep the number in list and say it's the only item in the list. So that was the active program. On this slide, we are now looking at the production plan part of the production type. The production plan is a list that contains objects of production job type. The production job type is shown on the right hand side of the slide. And the production job type contains an identifier identifying the job. Two nodes called runs completed and runs planned. Those show how many runs of the job shall be executed and how many have been executed already. It contains the number in list we have already seen with the production type. Again, it is used to enumerate the jobs in the production job list. It contains a number of production programs. This is the list where programs are used in an ordered list. It optionally contains a list of part sets. In this whole presentation, we will not look at part sets further. And it always contains a state. We have seen the state with the production active program type already. And on the next slide, we will have a closer look at it. The state for the program and the job we have seen on the preceding slides uses the state machine shown on this slide. There are five states, initializing, running, ended, interrupted and aborted, and all the transitions shown with arrows in this picture are possible. Both states and transitions are enumerated and the OPC UA server will always give the name of the state or transition and the number. The appropriate item will be given in the state attribute of the job or of the program. This slide shows a few more model aspects of the state machine. You have seen the basic construction of the production state machine on the previous slide. Now we have three state machines inheriting from it, the production job state machine, the production program state machine, and the production part state machine. The reason we have three state machines 
is that we send events with every transition. And these events contain the information about the job or the program or the part that is important to identify the respective element and to convey things that change over the state machine's cycle. For example, in the production job transition event type shown on the bottom of this slide, there's the identifier of the, of the job type and the number of runs completed. And as you might expect, the number of runs completed gets counted upwards every time the state running is, um, is left. On the right hand side, you can see the table as you would find it in the specification that specifies that the respective event is sent at every transition. Now we have seen the main contents of the model and can move on to the examples. The first example is the easiest one as we thought of it, a machine tool that doesn't handle jobs at all, that only handles programs. In this example, it is called Retrofit Machine. And as it doesn't handle job nodes or jobs in general, the production plan node is not instantiated. The production plan would be the list with the jobs in it. The optional components of the active program, job node ID and job identifier, are also not instantiated as there is no job they could relate to. The programs themselves can be identified by name. In this example, the program name is duck.nc. And here you can see this number in list being zero as the active program is always used as a single program. So it is always the only program in the current list. If that program duck.nc is started, the state machine would show the appropriate states. On this slide, it is shortened and the aborted and interrupted states are missing. And only the normal cycle is shown from initializing to running to ended and then back to initializing. It is possible to map this information to jobs. So if this machine tool should first produce 10 yellow ducks and then 20 red ducks, you could just count the number of transitions. So in the state pictured on the slide, the 10 yellow ducks are finished and the fifth of the red ducks is being produced at the moment. However, to do that, it is important to know how many ducks are produced by one run of the duck.nc program, because I can only count how often the program has run. In this example, the program produces one duck per run, and that's how I can count the number of ducks that are produced. The information how many ducks are produced by one program is not shown if the jobs are not modeled. This leads us to our next example, the example of a static job. The third example will be a dynamic job, and I hope that will convey what static and dynamic means in this case. As jobs are modeled now, the production plan node exists in the static machine. It contains a fixed number of jobs. This is the static part. In this example, it is exactly one job. And the production programs node in the static job contains a fixed number of programs, which are instances of pro production program type. In this image, I used a shorthand to create fewer items in the image. And I used the active program. This is technically correct as the active program is an instance of production program type. But this means that the machine job can always only have one program. If I would like the job to have more than one program optionally, I could instantiate two programs in the production programs part and copy the running one to the active program. That would be the more widely used approach. Now, if a job is loaded onto that machine tool, its identifier is shown in the address space 
In this case, the identifier is yellow ducks. The same identifier is copied to the active programs job identifier. The name of the program itself is again duck.nc as in the previous example. And the node ID of the machine job 4320 is in indicated in the active program as the job node ID. In this example with exactly one static job node ID, this will never change over the whole lifetime of the server. As the program is running, for example, being in the uh, having completed three runs of the program, being in the fourth one, we can see the runs planned being 10 from the beginning of the job. This is this is planned uh, right in, in the beginning and the runs completed are three. So I don't have to count anymore how often the job has has run. As soon as the yellow ducks are done and the second job with the red ducks starts, the identifier of the job changes. It is now red ducks and that is also represented in the job identifier of the active program. The runs planned for the red ducks job are 20 and at the moment four ducks are completed. This is the same snapshot as shown with the retrofit machine tool. The final example is for a dynamic job. Again, the production plan is initialized and it has a job. In this case, I just copied the job over from the static job example because the usage of the job is exactly similar. Again, the yellow ducks are produced first, three runs are completed, 10 runs are planned. The job node ID of the active program shows the respective node ID of the machine job and the job identifier of the active program shows the job identifier of the machine job. And again, I have the runs completed, so I don't have to count my state changes as I would have in the program only example. The difference to the static job example becomes apparent as soon as the second job is started. The second job becomes its own new job node. And this job node has its own node ID. The node IDs are always unique in the, in the namespace. So the node ID in the active program changes the first time in this slide set. The red ducks job looks the same as it did in the static example. The identifier is red ducks. We are looking at the same snapshot. The fifth duck is produced. So runs completed is four, runs planned is 20. Number in list is one now because it is the second job in the production plan. Um, both jobs have this production programs, which I didn't further draw in this picture because the slide is already pretty full. In both production programs lists, there would be this duck.nc program and both have a state. Uh, in the case of this slide, the state of the yellow ducks job would be ended while the state of the red ducks job would cycle between initializing, running and ended, as the red ducks job is still being produced. Now we have seen three examples, a simple machine showing only the program, a machine showing the jobs in a static namespace and a machine showing the, the jobs in a dynamic namespace. In parallel to these three concepts, there's the concept of the events used with the state machine. The state machine itself can be read by a client with a normal data access method. It can also be used with a subscription. However, if jobs are particularly fast paced, it can be confusing for a client if messages don't arrive in the correct order or if uh, the client reads and misses some messages, so information in between is missing. And the solution we generated for that problem is to send the events along with the state machine transitions. As mentioned, sending events is independent of the presented configurations. So it can be done with only the program, it can be done with the static address space, and it can be done with the dynamic address space. The events 
have the benefit that they have a source timestamp, which is the the best timestamp time the server knows of the event actually happening. So the client can reconstruct fast-paced jobs after they happened. And for the use cases I showed you on the first slide, for calculations like KPI, it is not important that this is in any way real-time conformant. So it is okay if the client just re receives everything. It doesn't really matter how long it takes to receive everything. Now, with the state changes, the object, so the program and the job, are also transmitted as well, as the events contain, for example, the runs completed. And with this information, a client can reconstruct what happened on a server running very fast, jobs and programs. As my last slide, here are the profiles of the OPC UA for machine tools. The basic profile has to be always supported. It contains all mandatory nodes, and it is shown on the base of this sketch here. It does contain something of the production model I have introduced to you on the previous slides, namely the active program and its state machine. Both of these are mandatory, so they are always included if the model is instantiated in its full mandatory specified content. Then there are two facets called production and production plan. And as you can see by the icon, they differ in the dynamic lists aspect. So production would use the address space in a static fashion, while production plan uses it in the dynamic fashion. Both of them use the OPC UA events in the fashion I have shown to you. However, it is perfectly fine, possible and useful per use case to instantiate the production plan node with the jobs, either in the static or the dynamic fashion without the events. The only thing that you can sort of see on this slide is that it doesn't conform to a whole facet we have specified so you wouldn't have that certified above the basic profile. Nevertheless, it is perfectly fine to have the jobs without the events. Now, thank you for listening to me and watching this video. If you have further questions, you can either contact me or Götz Gurisch, as shown on this slide.